So for the 33rd time this meet here at Gulfstream Park West, we welcome you to this live Wednesday edition of Gulfstream West Today. Keisha Courtney, Jason Blewett, live from our Gulfstream studios as we have 10 races, not eight, not nine, but a 10-pack today on the card. <laughs> yes, hope you did your homework. We have some carryovers today as well. 10 races in this six-day racing week, of course, will be dark for much of next week, just racing Friday, Saturday, and Sunday after Thanksgiving as we start to wrap things up here mm -hmm. at Gulfstream Park West, getting set for opening day at the championship meet across town at Gulfstream Park on December 2nd. Yeah, it sounds great. We are really in the home stretch in Miami Gardens now. Rain has been an issue here and there throughout this meet. It was a fairly wet October and of course Mother Nature did give us a little rain in the early morning hours before training began and as a result we are sloppy but we're on the turf today and the grass obviously listed good as we just give you a little rundown as to what's on tap and nobody hit the super high five in yesterday's finale race number eight won by the favorite at two to one and that means we have just about a grand in the super high in race number one and of course that is also the start of today's 50 cent early pick five acacia will have an early and a late pick five coming your way and that carryover continues to build with each racing card and we're we're almost at 30K. We're almost at 30,000 in the Rainbow Six that starts in race number five today on today's 10 race program. And then we wrap things up with the 50 cent late pick five. As Jason said, I'll tackle the pick fives today. He will have the Rainbow Six ticket and together we will hopefully bring you some money. Now we were fast and firm here at GPW yesterday for that abbreviated eight race program on a very rare Tuesday. And I walked away from that card thinking, man, early speed, really wire to wire speed was the way it seemed to be on the turf. If you had early speed, there was a good chance you were going to be there first or certainly in the thick of things at crunch time. And I'm wondering, I really feel like that is a major plot to today's 10 race card as we start that first pick five on the turf. I'm wondering who you use. Well, you have one to two right now on your current favorite, the number four, I go for greatness. And you can see my comment. It's a speedy opener because hmm. there is quite a bit of early speed in this first race. Now I go for greatness is tactical. I am understand him being the favorite quite a bit and this is something we kind of saw at the especially towards the end of last year's Gulfstream Park West meet as well that that early speed really can carry you particularly on the turf using two horses with recent transactions in the four river arena in race number two the third race it's all about the return of little Baker off of a layoff since June a reclaim for trainer Ralph Zadie I'll back myself up though um, with two horses in there also using the number one monkey money who's a bit of a long shot play for me today using three horses in the fourth race in that uh, sixteen thousand dollar claiming event and then three deep in the fifth boston mine trying to get out of second gear i do prefer a couple others but i will use her on my ticket for 36 dollars. and she has burned quite a bit of money as she comes out of a loss at four to five switching from a good post today to jockey miguel vasquez for trainer ronnie spatz now as we talk about this field in the first you might get a a very fast pace here and maybe you got a little overly gung-ho in leaving the number four I go for greatness out of the top two but I do like a horse towards the outside and the number seven magician's bullet but really any way you slice this race I go for greatness has been so consistent and so sharp at 5'8 since getting to Florida with Antonio Sano he is undoubtedly the starting point that's definitely what I like about him he won as the favorite last time we'll backtrack to that last race toy can actually finish second to him he came on to win after that on the lead right now in the blue cap is the number two toy and right behind him is I go for greatness and that's kind of how they went around the early part of the race we know toy is going to send the, uh, that early speed is the name of his game again he had a victory after that the number three in there I go for greatness drifting a little bit in the stretch but did manage to run down these top two were much the best I wanted to include magician's bullet on my ticket but trying to keep it on the more affordable sure. side I didn't and just use those two but certainly this is a I think more than just a one to two shot yeah and it's very early on again almost an hour out mm -hmm. from race number one when you consider we have a start time a listed start time at 12 35 and the the odds are obviously going to change and you've got hot riding Edgar Zion on your top pick as he comes out of another multi-win program here at GPW. And although we have a few more cards, I mean, we have, what, 
the rest of this week. We have five consecutive days, including today and then next Friday through Sunday. He's bridged the gap, though, even though there's quite a bit of racing left. It's 39-36 with him and Amisael. He's had a really fantastic meet in Amisael as well, just riding in top-notch form, and it seems like it's become the norm to see Edgar Zayas winning multiple on a day. Now, Magician's Bullet, who's speaking of Amisael, he's got the call on the outside for Elizabeth Dobles. Uh, I like the post, and I like the fact that this horse is likely to get a good setup, like I go for greatness, and he is coming out of a race in which he had a steady at a couple of different junctures around the far turn. It looked like entering the far turn on the GPW turf. Amisael was just going to kind of slide him right up into the pocket, but mm -hmm. horses need, in my estimation or my opinion, a good two to three feet when they switch their leads, and there just wasn't enough room for Magician's Bullet to get fully in that spot, so he had to steady out at a couple of different times on the turn, but I still thought ran pretty well last time out. He did, and uh, Misael rode him two back, and so he's being reunited with this horse. They also tried taking the blinkers off last time, and they'll put them back on. I don't think that that was any reason for the trouble. I agree with mm -hmm. you, just maybe didn't have enough racing room or racing luck, but um, kind of going back to where he ran a couple starts back when he was a little bit closer to the pace as well. Familiar foes in the first. Yes. There is a whole <laughs> bunch of black type and bold type, I should say, as far as the company lines. A lot of rematches going on and some horses that are just very, very tough when it comes to sprinting on the turf. Now we move on to race number two. It's a very difficult 6250 yes. three and up Philly Amer claimer. And don't let the fact that Acacia and I both have an ice cold 4 1 <laughs> exact to fool you. This race is, I'm actually surprised we I have too. <laughs> an agreement in the W column and first and second. But forgetting about that, Riverine has been, uh, been just solid. She's been good to me too. Uh, she's just been so consistently good running at or near the 6250 level. And she's got that speed where that positional speed where I think there's a good chance she can set up shot, maybe tracking the five or rhyme or dose and the number six, Bella Nusta. Yes, I, I, I like her tactically as well. Now she does have to take a step forward as she's running against open 6250 competition. If you look at the levels and where she ran, she got the non-winners of two, um, a respectable fourth stepping up after that. They put her into the straight non-winners of three last time and she did notch that. So this is a little bit of a step up, but she's been so good in her last couple of races. And I think that consistency, not to mention her running style, as you said, um, but the one recent transactions has been uh, kind of knocking on the door at this particular open 6250 It's good level. and bad though. That's it's a good blessing and, bad. and a curse. That's why I didn't put her on top. So can she take a step forward or is she just going to kind of continue picking up a check? That's my main concern with her. And she is a consistent filly. You're playing exactors, tries, the super high five, super effectors. But as far as delivering that knockout punch, she is obviously over her last three races had a tough time doing it, despite the fact she's been right there for trainer Jose Pynchon. And I would just add on Riverina, do note Charlie's secret, who was a big even money favorite in her last race, stumbled and lost mm -hmm. the rider out of the gate. So that was very much an easier spot, considering the favorite had no rider aboard. Rima Dos and the number three Beauty of a Day seem to fit okay. And in the case of Beauty of a Day, I've been waiting for her, <laughs> and obviously I have given up waiting for her to really take a big step forward or at least get back to one of her better races for a great trainer in Steve Cosera. Her last two were pretty disappointing, and yes, it was on a sloppy track two starts back, but last time just really didn't uh, run as well as you would have liked to see her because she had been very good earlier on when with Elizabeth Dobos and even Henry Collazo. So we'll see if she can take a step forward. I used her at a bit of a price, but uh, I think she, we got to see more from her. All right. Like we will see more of her today, yes. and we'll see more of Little Baker. It's been about 170 days, just under 170 days, about five and a half months since we last saw Little Baker in action. He's a nine-time winner, a uh, rock-solid uh, turf sprinting six-year-old gelding by uh, Forestry, and he is the horse to beat. It does feel, and we've talked about this before, if you're familiar with the product and the, the racing scene here in South Florida, it feels like on a quality horse-for-horse -horse basis up and down the shed road talking 
older, hard-nosed geldings and some tough older mares. Ralph Zadie has more <laughs> solid turf sprinters in his barn than anybody else on this he, circuit, right? He certainly right? does. Of course, pay any price comes to mind and oh, some yeah. of the other uh, tough ones that he does have on both the dirt and turf. But Little Baker certainly does fit that bill, and we'll backtrack to his last race. This was on June 3rd. As I mentioned earlier, he's actually a reclaim for Ralph Zadie. He's on the outside right now, and he was actually three wide the entire way um, through this race. And then as he starts to kind of make that move midway through the turn to try and pull away, if we can just freeze right there, he never really had a breather. He is dueling uh, with the number three horse, Grand the Man, who's that gray horse right here next to him. The one horse on the inside will fade out. And then on the outside, it does unfortunately set up for the number five, All About Diva, to come and catch him as we let it roll through the wire. But that being said, I don't think he really lost anything in defeat. He was only beaten by half a length. It was a big performance from him. He's off the layoff now. Uh, but the barn, Ralph Sadie, first off the claim, 61 to 180 day layoff, four for 13 over the past five years and nine for 13 in the money. So he knows how to get a horse back to the track. That's funny. And this actually, hearing that stat makes me think of playing horses in this day and age, <laughs> how easy it is to get lost, and I feel like I'm always wa walking that balancing act of trying not to get lost in a maze of stats, mm -hmm. because we will show you one, and getting a little more specific, these are turf sprinters, and again, this barn has a lot of good turf sprinters in it, and you would think Ralph Zadie, well, laid him up from three to six months, and uh -huh. this horse kind of is in the middle of that sample with five and a half months between races. In turf sprints alone, just one for 11, and obviously at a, with an ROI of 39 cents, I mean, these are horses yeah. that have established form and are oftentimes returning and underperforming at very short prices. Mm -hmm. I still feel, for all the obvious reasons, that Little Baker's going to win, but again, just trying to give you the, the full picture <laughs> here, and we are betting money and not matchsticks, uh, mm -hmm. it was worthwhile noting that negative stat. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Atizapan, I thought he would run well for Armando de la Cerda mm -hmm. as he comes off a 16 and a half month layoff. And why don't you enlighten us a little bit about a horse you used in the early pick five, yes. who's by the green monkey, which he gets some points <laughs> for that in monkey money. I think he's got to be one of the best progeny of the green oh, he's monkey. he's the best, not even, one. He's the best one anything, I've seen. The best one I've seen, that's for sure. Um, this is my price play. I'm thinking he's going to get overlooked in the wagering, especially with Atizapan coming off of the layoff and Little Baker with this really good form. If you cross off the two-turn race last time, he has very solid form off the layoff for Monty Thomas, especially right here at Gulfstream Park West. I know his last win was on the sealed sloppy track, but before that, only beaten by three quarters of a length beyond Jack of Diamonds. All right, Abby Bedita up. He's really up this game. Mm -hmm. He has Big improved time. all around. This is the best I think Abby's ridden in his young career, and he'll look to keep it going with the gelding by the Green Monkey. <laughs> As we move on to race number four, we're ever so close to the opening leg of Wednesday's Rainbow Six. As we get back on the dirt with the two-year-old $16,000 claim race. Jay Stone, top morning line maker. Guy does a tremendous job year-round on this circuit. However, I was a little surprised to see Rogue Patriot, who I picked on top at 6-5. to five. I felt sure. this race was a little more open than a horse who's just going to be an overwhelming favorite, even though I wound up picking Rogue Patriot. I'm not sure if I mishandicapped the race or misread <laughs> things, and I see if Rogue Patriot is indeed a heavy favorite, you're going to take a little shot against him. I am, and it's interesting because I used him. I used him second. I certainly think he has a big shot in you here. You went three deep, though, you, and I, I was did. happy to see I that. I did, and you didn't even use the horse I have on top, which is, I know it's a big guess, but um, I think Saturado uh, is is just on the drop. He's actually shockingly similar to Rogue Patriot as far as on paper, so I'm thinking that this is a horse. You get Tyler Gaffleone up. There's lots of precocity on both the top and the bottom. The dam was a uh, one at two, and uh, Turf to Dirt allowed Allowance for claiming Joe, or allowance to, to claiming Joe Arsino's four for eight and six for eight winning. So I'm thinking that this is one that might be overlooked and just might be in the right spot. Allowance to claiming Joe is four for eight, huh? Turf to dirt and Turf allowance to, dirt. to claiming. Wow, yeah, yeah, that's a move he has got down pat. Yeah. Wow, that is a very obviously niche stat, but a good mm -hmm. number. Had I known that and looked at that, <laughs> I probably would have had your horse in my super. Now, as far as Rogue Patriot goes, I mean, the thing that really grabs hold of you, I think, aside from the fact he can put himself 
in the game mm -hmm. is the drop in class. Uh, he's been turfing in his last couple, hasn't run all that great on the turf. As he gets back to the dirt today, though, the one thing that really won me over, we've seen a real uptick in Sappy Joseph mm -hmm. Jr., and I think the overall production and good efforts he's been getting out of his horses, say, in the last two weeks, and I think he's got a, a hot barn who might not appear all that hot on his side today. So that's ultimately why I picked the number five Rogue Patriot, and in talking about good trainer stats, we've got Gilberto Zerpa, who we know, native of Venezuela, mm -hmm. He's got outrageously big, otherworldly numbers off the claim, but he's done very, very well picking up horses off victories and running them back. And he has the number four, Zing Zing. Let's get down to it with the little stat here with Zing Zing. I mean, this is a trainer who's done some mighty fine work in the numbers department at five for 14. Pretty good. It really is. And this is a horse that certainly was very precocious, had a lot of early speed with Angel Rodriguez, been working very sharply at Gulfstream Park West since being claimed by Gilberto Zerpa as well, looking like he's just going to run out from the gate. Yeah, he's got that early speed, and if you want the likely controlling speed, it is Zing Zing, mm -hmm. who is definitely aptly yes. named. <laughs> as we Zing Zing right through this little timeout here on Gulfstream West today, we will turf and find out when we return if Boston Mine is the goods today. Coming down to the finish with Fort Arlington catch and they're not going to catch him. Fort Martin, the winner, he went clear of the bell, and he's coming home, turning hand spring, more love it, brilliant in the same of Costa. What a score, Reddy, remembering the stop passing, Fort Martin, the deep, nose and nose for the wire, Fort Martin has won it. And Ghost Zephyr is pulling away. Blows them away with an eye opening performance. Oh, again has won. Go separate kicking clear. Shaman goes. And a hearty rejoiner here on this Wednesday edition of Gulfstream West with Acacia and Jason. And again, walking down memory lane with some of those uh, Adina Spring Stallions. It doesn't get any better than Ghost Zapper, but hearing Larry Comis call Shaman Ghost in the Woodward in the summer of 2016, I'm happy to read that he is back in training with mm -hmm. Jimmy Jerkins and on his way to Florida this winter. We're very excited about that. We did see him run very well in the Pegasus World Cup Invitational last year right here in South Florida across town at Gulfstream Park. So we're very much looking forward to all of those uh, horses and trainers that'll be shipping in very yep. soon. Big fan of Jimmy Jerkins and we have a Kelly Breen starter today. Jeremiah Engelhart run it tomorrow and there was somebody else up, Brendan Walsh who's got Zito. a horse. And yeah, Nick yeah. Zito as well. Brendan Walsh and Nick Bull have horses in the coming days here so we are starting to hit that championship vibe here as we uh, basically wrap things up here in Miami Gardens but we can't wrap things up without talking about the Rainbow Six and in a rarity I've got my Rainbow Six ticket <laughs> and Acacia and I were talking during the break and much like your late pick five which everybody will see in a couple of seconds we are singling tip sheet in race number six. He looks so good to me, doesn't he? Does look hard to beat indeed. And I like that you went with the 4320, the magic number. Yes, I was <laughs> actually in doing the math and I double checked everybody. That is not my strong suit. <laughs> 216 combinations with that sequence right there. And that goes to show you the bang for your buck you get in the mm -hmm. Rainbow Six for a 20 cent wager. And aside from having Tip Sheet, who seems like he's going to be a monstrous odds on favorite in the sixth race, I'm wondering how is the turf going to play today? Because we ran five grass races on an eight race card here at GPW yesterday. Three were one wire to wire. Nobody seemed to really be able to make up any significant ground. And the average win margin, I looked this up because it just felt like there was one daylight turf winner after another, it was about five lengths. Mm -hmm. So uh, turf and, and if there's any sort of bias or preferred running style remains to be seen. But in talking about this crew for the fifth race, the opening leg of the rainbow, they've got to get around Boston Mine. But again, 
That's happened before. Yes, it was bet down 90 cents to the dollar last time, and she ran a very good race. She was only beaten by half a length. But that being said, she was really far off the pace last time. She had set the pace two starts back. Um, search for Sammy ended up catching her. I took a stab against her, and it is with a horse that's 0 for 10. And I'm going to go with Quack Quack, who um, I think this could set up for her. She had dropped to this maiden 10 level two starts back. That, that was her first time at the this level on the turf last time did finish behind Boston Mine, but I hope that she just is the main controlling speed yep. in here. A lot of the other horses I think that could potentially figure like along the trail or even uh, baby Isabella are just going to be the late running types that I just don't think are going to have enough to work with here. No, if Quack Quack gets a turf course, and again, the rails were up for the first mm -hmm. time this meet yesterday, entering the new week here at GPW at 20 feet, she may really move up. I mean, she makes a lot of sense to begin with. And and that might be the extra edge that she needs. I also like the rider change to Luis Castillo mm -hmm. with her. Riding who had very a, well. Riding well, yeah. having a great meet. I would imagine his confidence, at least currently, is at an all-time high. And he had a, a big winner on the turf yesterday by almost nine lengths in the form of erotic kiss. So that brings us on to a tip sheet in race number six. As we head to the main, we go a two-turn mile, and there's nothing wrong with a with starting a late pick five with a nice crew of two-year-old allowance optional claimers and this Florida bred your single and Who'd you build a ticket around? Well, it's going to rip the Band-Aid off early, and we're going to start right here. Not only does Tip Sheet have the class, having been a very good second to Sutosh in the in reality last time, but he certainly has the pedigree to go the distance of the mile, going the two turns, and he went the mile in a 16th no problem last time. I'm going to use three horses in the seventh race. I think that that one's kind of uh, got some questions with some horses off the layoff That's or going race. dirt yep. to turf. That's a tough one. Um, race number eight, using two I would have liked to use more in there race number nine you kind of have it's like a tale of two horses gray dude just might be the best horse and then you've got the Todd Fletcher runner candy asset coming off of the layoff who did win at first asking but gray dude back on the turf has been uh, excellent lately lots of questions in the finale I used four horses in there $24 for me yeah there's not much to dig your teeth onto as far as turf form mm -hmm. or maybe obvious turf pedigree in the last Gerald Bennett has a couple of first Firsters entered, or he had entered a couple. He decided to scratch Rattlesnake Rose, and he sends out R. Swift Taylor, <laughs> who does get a Misael Jaramillo, mm -hmm. and that horse might be live as he takes on a second-time starter from Kathleen O'Connell. But again, Arendelle and uh, Stanley Gold, and speaking of a Misael, he's got the mount on tip sheet. And this cult by Brethren obviously grabbed the bull by the horns and took the proverbial cat out of the bag last time when he was able to stretch out and mm -hmm. go two turns. And maybe maybe Sutosh didn't bring his A game, and maybe he was a little little tired as far as his reserves went. But anyway, you slice it. I mean, a repeat of that effort should just bury this field, right? I would certainly think so. And we'll show that race. This was, again, in the in reality. My biggest thing that I liked about it was that he was really the only main foe to Sutosh in there. He was the number two in the green cap as we pick it up from the quarter pole. Um, behind him was Highborn, who kind of threw the towel in a little bit at this point. And uh, Tip Sheet had broken well, kind of secured a spot along the rail, shifted out late, and was trying to catch Sutosh. Of course, couldn't, but he kept on very strongly. And he would have been a winning performance without, uh, again, Sutosh in the race. So certainly if he runs like that, he hasn't run since September 30. If they've given him a little bit of time, really sharp work on the main track at Gulfstream since then. And this all, all I should say, harkens back to, I think, the word on the street about the Brethren's that mm -hmm. with experience, a little foundation, and certainly father distance. time, they <laughs> were going to hit their best stride. Mm -hmm. And with that distance and, and time, I think we're starting to see it. And uh, tip sheet again, I think he's going to be an overwhelming favorite, as do you. Now, as uh, we move on to race number seven and get down to the wire on this Wednesday card, things certainly open up here off a horse who I think is going to be around one to two or so. And the seventh race is a very tricky event. <laughs> and the more I looked at it, I said, hmm, the one classic Charlotte doesn't really grab you, per se, or at least didn't really jump off the page to me. But the more I looked at her, she is taking a monstrous 
drop in class, but mm -hmm. it's a realistic, logical drop in class. I wouldn't sell her short. I really think she catches a feel that if she can run it all, she's really going to make a presence felt for 8,000. The drop is certainly needed, and this is the type of barn and connections that do surprise you in a field like this when they have a live horse. Of course, money or love comes to mind. So she certainly figures, I had a nightmare of a time with this race in general. I landed on Flying Queen going back to the turf, even though her win did come on the sealed sloppy track last time. I'm kind of hoping that it's one of those deals that she finally broke her maiden. And sometimes horses, even though they take a long time to break their maiden, when they do, they're able to maintain that form and certainly trust Victor Barbosa Jr. to do that. Mm -hmm. She's got plenty of turf pedigree on the bottom side. The dam was a four-time grass winner, and her sibling Menahune, we're familiar with in Florida, is certainly best on the turf. But um, to the outside, Sassy Slew was a bit of a head scratcher for me. You know that better be fast is going to be the speed. There's just a lot of moving pieces in this race. There very much are a lot of moving pieces. And looking at Sassy Slew and Jose Pynchon's other runner in race two today, recent transactions, mm -hmm. They kind of remind me of the same they horse. Do. Very <laughs> consistent. They always seem to fire, yet they don't win all the time, mm -hmm. and they're usually bet because they have that consistent exposed form. Seventh race gave me fits. <laughs> I'm in the boat of Classic Charlotte pulling off the upset. Now, as we move on to race number eight, we have a $10,000 maiden claimer. These are fillies and mares on the dirt going six furlongs. Very few scratches and changes on the card today, and mm -hmm. the horsemen in the racing office need to be commended for that, even with the uh, track slot and the turf listed is good. It's a handful of scratches at best today. You could take out the eight commissioned, our lone defection, and we go with the field of nine. And, uh, well, you and I have basically the same try box jumbled up as I preferred the number three. Little Florentina, give me that speed. Mm -hmm. This one likely to show some speed with the seven for the fam. And your horse, your top pick, Tavrita, makes a lot of sense, too. Tavrita does. I'm hoping that she's a little bit closer than she was last time. I like that she's second off the layoff. You mentioned the barn going well. Yep. Um, they claimed her, ran her once, going long in December, gave her a layoff, came back sprinting. I think she's better sprinting for sure and would expect her to take a step forward. All right. Maybe if Flying Queen comes back and yes. gets it done in race number seven today, you can upgrade the Chances a little bit <laughs> with Tavrida. And again, little Florentina comes out of that same race. I really prefer the rematch from October the 28th. Now, as we move on to race number nine, we've got a couple of turfers late in the card, and grass is no doubt where it's at for both halves of the late double as this fifty to forty thousand dollar fairly high price claimer for three and up Colts and Geldings goes as race number nine. You said it best, I think, occasion talking about your late pick five play that even though you didn't single him great dude is the centerpiece at least starting off I almost did single him yeah, and I ended good. up I ended up backing myself up with the rail runner but we'll backtrack to his last turf race so this is actually two starts back for gray dude he was 21 to 1 that day and we're going to start with the head on of the break he's the number four because he actually had a nightmare trip and still managed to win Armando has just done a fantastic job with him if we freeze right there you can just see uh, that he's totally boxed in gets cut off and ends up laughing as we let it roll from there. So he's at the way back of the pack. A great dude sandwich A early on, right? A great dude sandwich <laughs> early on. And he just gets totally wiped out. And now we still don't see anything from Gray Dude. And where is he? If we can just freeze, I thought that Jose Batista did a fantastic job with this ride. There he is getting bumped and sandwiched again as they weave through traffic as we let it go down to the wire. Instead of going out wide because there's so many horses wide, he manages to get him through the traffic and slip up the rail and it's really amazing that he actually won this race again the connections have done a great job it was a perfectly timed ride to just barely get there and this was really a window and some foreshadowing into how jose batista would be mm -hmm. riding throughout the meet here at gulfstream west he is at the top of his game and obviously armando who was a little cold mm -hmm. through the first month or so his barn is really yes. heated up and picked up steam and i think I think Gray Dude really beat a better field two mm -hmm. back in that Jack Flats. Now, that field did not include a layoff horse for trainer Todd Pletcher, who's got Gaff Leone riding in the one candy asset. Now, this horse did win after the championship meet last April over at Gulfstream Park, April 19th, to be precise. Here's a little kind of quirky stat, but a move <laughs> that was just so outrageously big felt compelled to send in this number with this second time starting Colt by Candy Ride. So we're talking six months or more off the bench with a last out winner, 28 
for 58 for about 50 percent it's pretty crazy wow <laughs> and that roi as well and after we're done with that stat i thought let's just show his debut race as he did win at first asking and it's a pretty incredible stat to have and uh, of course todd fletcher has fantastic numbers with a lot of his runners before we start out front is the number two mirrors he was very comfortable and loose on the lead early um, the number one who was ridden by edgar zayas that day as we let it roll from the quarter pole tyler gaffleon picking up the mount today but edgar made a very sharp move in here in injecting a little bit more pace to not let that horse get too comfortable up on the front end so moved him a little bit early um and was chasing after him so kept on very strongly to get the win he had to fend off the number four who was distorted union that race did produce two next out winners candy asset off the layoff coming back as a gelding and jason mentioned the great stats and it's not like this horse is taking some wonky or crazy drop mm -hmm. in for fifty thousand off a lengthy layoff that dates back to april 19th this horse did win first down for maiden mm -hmm. 50 so todd obviously pretty bullish on just running this horse at a claiming race because that's where he fits and uh, candy asset obviously a dangerous horse today in a race that also includes the returning team valor horse the french bred mm -hmm. speak with me who i thought had a little chance mm -hmm. and we'll see how he does from post number two it's a very good race late in the card now we go from established uh, colts and geldings to some <laughs> guesswork here in the nightcap as we wrap it up in race number 10 a two-year-old filly $35,000 maiden claimer, and I have a feeling most, as far as the multis go, you'd love to just bang out the all button and mm, buy the race, yeah. but I have a feeling most will be pretty much in tune and in sync with the top three horses of you and I. The uh, first are for Bennett, our Swift Taylor, and then you've got the second time starters, pretty overdriven for Kathleen O'Connell and the number five catharsis for David Braddy. What I liked about the four pretty overdriven is there there is a bit of turf pedigree to work with and you mentioned this earlier the guessing game with this is that some of these horses just don't really have any sort of obvious turf pedigree maybe uh, didn't even run well in their debut race but you've got Kathleen O'Connell Edgar Zayas this horse took a lot of money first time out as well and this is a filly that's half to stakes winner if it wasn't for Texas who was a six-time turf winner in fact two turf winning siblings all right Edgar sitting on another big day him Tyler or Misael they ride a lot the bulk of the card and we'll see what transpires on this 33rd day of the GPW fall me we'll take a little breather on Gulfstream West today and send it up to our man high in the sky, that's the one and only Chris Griffin for Scratches and Changes.